Good afternoon. My name is Peter Rossi. I'm on the board of the American Brachytherapy Society, and I'm really excited and pleased to bring you this event today. We're waiting. Um, there's going to be slow connections to audio and video for some people as they join. So I'll just kind of slowly start our introduction, but we expect about 100 um, professionals today online to talk about this incredibly important event. Um, we're going to be talking about physician burnout, as you know. Um, so let me let me just start by presenting Dr. Mira Keys. Um, she provided a keynote discussion on this at our, our ABS meeting in Big Sky just before the pandemic. Um, Dr. Keyes is a professor in radiation oncology and of the Division of Surgery at the University of, University of British Columbia. Um, she is a clinical trialist. She's, she's a dear friend. She's been, she's influential in her, at, her, at, at her university and her community and at an international level um, to all of us. And we're really thankful to have her here today. Joining Mira is Dr. Brian Moran. He's been a, a friend of well over in, into three decades, as well as Mira for me and a mentor. Um, Brian is the founder of, well, Brian, how about, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself real quickly. And, and also Mira, I don't wanna steal the whole show, but um, Brian, why don't you tell us who you are and where you came from? Well, I'm Brian, you know, most of, I know most of you obviously. Um, and I'm very, I think this is a very, very important topic. And we are so lucky to have Dr. Key. Okay. okay. Yeah. I'm on mute. Can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you just the, fine, Brian. The 14. Okay. I think people need to mute the mic. Somebody's unmuted. Maybe people on the phone. So, um, you know, I'm very fortunate to have interacted with both you, Peter. In fact, I tried to hire you probably 20 some years ago, but, um, and Mira, it's been a joy to be a colleague of yours. Uh, and I've, I've done a lot of brachytherapy. I've been a very active clinician for th over 30 years, um, high energy, triple A alpha. And then all of a sudden, bam, it was like a race car driver. I just swung up into the wall. I didn't know where I was. And it's like some song. I woke up and I'm like, where am I? What, what has happened to me? And, you know, I, I figured things out. I went through a lot of personal things and professionally. I know one of the questions one of our colleagues asked was about the pressures upon us in these changing times in healthcare. And they are, they're real. They are very real. I was always a very cavalier, like, ah, no problem, we'll do it. And these are forces that are, be, are, are so powerful and beyond us um, that we have to recognize this up front before you're a victim of it. And I reached out to Mira, I, I looked at the schedule at Big Sky and I said, oh my gosh, you're talking about physician burnout. And I pulled her in the back, I said, Mira, I, I don't know, can you help me? And she invited me up to the sit at the table while she gave that beautiful lecture, the incredible lecture. And, and then, um, you know, people were coming up to me all the rest of the weekend, the meeting and saying, I have these, this is going on. I'm like, you know, be, you have to be aware of this. So Peter, I don't want to take, I'll only answer questions because I don't want to, <laughs> Go on and on. I don't know. ADD, I, you know, my no, it's, mind. A, it's a wonderful segue as we start up. And, and Dr. Keyes, tell us how you became professionally interested in physician burnout. You're, you're the muted one now, Mira. I'm the muted. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I think we all go through this, we just don't really realize. And really the uh, there's incidence and prevalence, right? And incidence of this is actually very high as well as the prevalence. And I'll show you that in my slides. Everybody gets burned out and some people notice it, some people don't notice it, but I got into some really uh, this dire strait about five years ago and I realized, my God, this, is, this cannot continue this way and try to kind of pedal back and see what's wrong and what can I change and, and realize that some are problems with the institutions and the systems and some are really personal issues that I needed to deal with and change how I relate to my work and what it means and uh, 
how much I give, we are really typically in the healthcare system, like really over givers. And that costs us a lot at the end. We, we just can't over give all the time. So that was my interest. And the other thing is that my daughter got into medical school. And I always thought like, do I want her to have the same system as, uh, as it is right now? Or do I want to, can I do something to change that? And so that has been, you know, apart from love for brachytherapy, now it has become my second love to actually teach about physician burnout. So once people are aware that they're not crazy and this is real, real um, they begin to perhaps make some changes and even a little change over the period of time actually helps tremendously. So this is really about educating all of you today here on the call about this issue and just telling you a few things what you can do and where the real issue is and how to re-engage in all of this. Now, that's fantastic. Um, you mentioned prevalence. So um, if, if not everybody has had the opportunity to look at your slides and your excellent record or um, your report to us, but what, what is the real prevalence? What, what, do we re what are we really seeing when we survey oncologists in the United States and Canada? Well, you know, at any single moment, it depends on how the burnout is actually defined. And I'll, I'll go over that a little bit as well. There's three categories that we get to burn, to be approximately burned out um, in. And so if we are burned out in all three domains, then we, this is a real, almost like a clinical um, diagnosis and people who are really burned out may need up to 18 months to recover after all of this and they need professional help. And then there is a lot of us who have, who are kind of down on one of these scales. And so we'll go over to what the scales are and what can, we can do about this. But um, so, so that just signifies that there is a problem if the problem is not addressed and may actually continue to, you know, go down the hill until we really hit that burnout, um, you know, uh, red light and then that will stop us in, in the tracks. Mira, can I interrupt you for a moment? Go ahead. Um, what very briefly? What are those three categories? And I want. I'm to just going to. I have the whole presentation, so I'm eager to actually go over this with you. Okay. And I then maybe in the I middle of the, in, in the middle of the presentation, maybe you can you can stop me and and you can always uh, say, Brian, I I want to say something. Here's Brian, and and I'll be gladly Brian. give you a microphone, and then you can say uh, I can your experience. I assure you, I had every one of them. And yeah. And I'll interrupt just to say real quickly, this is, we're actively monitoring the chat session for questions. We um, asked for questions beforehand that we're kind of diving into as we go through this initial um, discussion, but we're, we're, we're waiting for more. If you have a question, we're happy just to interrupt and go after it and, and try to address it. Um, Brian and Mira and myself are um, really just want to create a discussion as much as um, give you content. So um, go ahead, Mira, it's all you. Okay, so we'll share the screen now. So let me just see how that goes. I guess, do you see my screen now? Yes. See the screen, yeah, okay. So uh, the title of the talk is burnout, physician burnout when working harder is not working. So I think we can all relate to that. And so what is the burnout and uh, World Health Organization actually now recognize this as a full syndrome resulting from chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. And these are your three scales, exhaustion. So you're really personally, just really tired physically. There's a depersonalization or some people like to call it compassion fatigue, lack of efficiency, or really you become very ineffective in, in what you do. Some people call that a moral injury, but I don't think that's a, it's a really a burnout. It's more like a depersonalization. That's really moral injury. And you start asking yourself questions. I'm not sure how much longer can I go on like this? And if I keep going, I'm afraid somebody will get injured because I'm going to make a mistake. And so I love this cartoon. Now, interns work extreme, extremely long hours and the harnesses will help them awake, be awake during your operation. So you certainly don't want to have surgery or something like this, right? But that's what happens all the time. And so this is what I learned in my, you know, mid 50s, no matter how far have you gone on the wrong road turn back turn back really so here it is lifetime incidence of burnout is 100 percent 
So basically everybody gets burned out in this profession. And then some people kind of recover and then sometimes burnout is not so severe. So they kind of come back and prevalence at any single time is 40 to 60%. And again, depends on how you actually define it. A lot of pub publications are defining burnout as um, uh, abnormal or negative score in one of these three segments, not in all of them. And the burnout is really when you have all of three scales that are actually in minus. So what are we gonna do today? We're gonna learn a little bit about burnout <clears throat> and you can ask yourself a question. Am I actually a burnout and see where you are? We'll talk to Brian, of course, and he will tell us his personal experience. And we'll talk a little bit about what can we do about this. And I, at the end of the day, I want people to uh, realize that they need to actually engage in advocacy for our own profession. And we also need to engage in our organizations and we have to help others and help colleagues. And I think that's the best use of this time that we're gonna spend today, one hour. So why am I talking about is because I have been there and back. That's why, and I, and I want people to, if they're there mm -hmm. to come back. So what is the consequence of physician burnout? Well, there's really grave consequence, medical errors, mal malpractice risk, quality of care goes down. There's a very large staff turnover. Uh, physician disengagement, resistance to change, disruptive behaviors, people leave medicine. Uh, there is a divorce, there is substance abuse, uh, there is depression and suicide, and there is early retirement, which really is going to kind of jeopardize the number of oncologists that we may have or number of physicians. So one third of physicians show no burnout, one third have approximately moderate burnout and one third to one half have severe burnout. Again, depends on the scale that people use. And I started to advocate, at least in Canada, that this become an accreditation issue. So if you're going to fly and your pilot is completely tired, you know, they're actually not, a, not allowed to fly. They have to have, uh, you know, nap or sleep and then they can fly your plane. And so well, wouldn't you want your pilot to actually be well rested? And so why wouldn't your doctor have a right to be well rested, right? So I think this should be a accreditation issue. And this is basically an organizational issues. And we're just kind of suffering from that. There is a personal part that we play in all of this, but this is majorly organizational issue. So what are the causes of burnout? The first one is you, the personal stuff, the personal stuff. And so this is how we relate to ourselves, how we relate to our jobs, our, our you know, culture within ourselves. And then there is a the medical culture. I'll talk a little bit about this. And then there is organization. And the research really now suggests that burnout is primary a system level problem. And it's driven by excess job demands with inadequate resources and support. And it's really not an individual problem triggered by personal limitations. And I'll show you some recent data uh, to substantiate that. So you, the personal. Well, this cartoon, I love this. What seems to be a problem, Mrs. Johnson, I feel the way you look. And so I, I wonder sometimes this is how we actually look to the patients, right? Terrible. Okay, so here is a Medscape National Physician Burnout and Suicide Report from 2020. So this is before the COVID. And so what contribute to this burnout is really too many bureaucratic tasks. And I think you guys in the US are really much further ahead from Canadians. We have a different system. So you have probably more bureaucratic tasks than we do spending too many hours at work, lack of uh, respect from administration, that's a very recurring team, employing colleagues and staff, increased um, you know, medical records and computerized medicine, uh, compensation reimbursement and whatnot. And so the bottom graph actually shows you who is the really mostly burnout and Generation X, I actually have to kind of look at who are the Generation X. And so I'm close to being Generation X myself. So these are people from 40 to 55, there's 65 million of Generation X today in the US. And so they're probably the most, bur most burnout because they do have the kids and aging parents and they really pull a lot of work at work because they are your kind of senior oncologist. And uh, so they're still kind of heavily involved in work. And so what physicians are most burnout? So here we go, oncologists 42%. As per this report, urologists are really, really burnt out. And I find it's really disheartening that uh, Suicide attempted, one to two percent. Think about this, 24 percent. Think about suicide. This is really very sad. And nine percent actually prefer not to answer. And so on, on average, one doctor in the United States and his own life every single day. 
and uh, physician commit suicide twice the rate of the general population and over 1 million of patients will lose their doctor to suicide every year. This is really sad. So how do we cope? Well, really, we do nothing. So we isolate ourselves. Some people exercise, they're, I guess, the lucky ones. Some people are also lucky to talk to the family members and friends and open up. Some just sleep, eat junk food, do drugs, alcohol, and whatnot. But basically, depression is quite prevalent, 17%. So one in five of us is depressed. Um, we do not ask for help. We do not trust the professionals and, and so on and so forth. So this is where we are. So Canada had a big uh, Canadian Medical Association survey in 2018, 32% of all the physicians are burnt out. And so again, a lot of people are thinking about suicide and who's the most susceptible, younger uh, doctors and females. In the US, same year, 15,000 US physicians, again, burnt out in women, 48%, men, 38%. And again, a lot of depressed doctors and uh, <clears throat> Everybody complains about bureaucratic tasks and long working hours, EMRs and whatnot. And so your uh, National Academy of Medicine wants to kind of take the bull by the horns and do something about it and we'll see what happens. So this is oncology burnout specifically <clears throat> is about 38% of radiation oncologists are apparently burnt out. And really there's a prediction that this will significantly contribute to national shortage of oncologists in the actually quite near future. So I'd like to read the Medscape. I don't know if you guys read the Medscape, but this has really interesting articles. And in, this one talks about millennial doctors who are walking into the crisis. And what I particularly like about this one is that it really kind of touches a bit of a heart. And, you know, I don't know if you get upset when you're called a provider. I tend to be. I'm not a provider. I'm actually a physician. And so there's this kind of umbrella of providers, everybody's provider, and, and it's really now the whole system is moving into hiring more providers because they're cheaper to the healthcare system than, and they're kind of replacing physicians in a way. And there's also tendency to blame physicians for the increasing in healthcare costs, uh, which is, you know, I'll, I'll again show you some data to, to kind of just open up your eyes who is actually spending the money and who is making the money. And also there is uh, disappointment and anger because um, uh, there is increasing disregard for physicians. And I think all of us have actually felt that to one point or another. And it talks about millennials actually kind of walking into the situation and really um, you know, advocating for profession more loudly, which I am all for it. And so let's talk about you and the personal issues with burnout. And when I kind of finish this segment, maybe Brian can tell us a little bit more about you know, what happened with him. As so I love this mug, he says, I'm trying to be awesome today, but I'm exhausted from being so freaking awesome yesterday. So we can't be freaking awesome every day, right? Can we? It's not humanly possible, really. But that's what is expected from us. So why does the burnout happen? It happens because there is excessive job demands. And I think we all experience that. And this is really just, we are tired. And so lack of these resources and uh, exhaustion actually really makes us cynical. So we lose compassion towards ourselves and compassion towards the patient. And also we become kind of less effective at work and we accomplish less and we don't feel good about what we do. And that really affects our work culture. And so this is just, um, if you are, want to have my slides, I'm happy to share to, with everybody, but uh, there's these three scales of burnout. And really, if you're down on all of these three scales, that's a, that's a real problem. And a lot of people are actually down on one of the scales. And it's just in all of these reports that I'm mentioning, it depends on how the burnout is called. Just, you know, all three scales are down or just one. So why does it happen really? So everybody can relate to this. We all have this 800 pound gorilla in our house. And so it's difficult to ignore gorilla. And we also married and have family problems and kids and finances and aging parents and God knows what. We also want to, you know, have some hobbies and friends along the side. And, um, but, uh, you know, we also have interests outside of the medicine, but it's also difficult to kind of juggle all of this at the same time particularly if the kids are small, my God, help us out. Mm. Um, I certainly been there, know that quite well. And then there's oncology challenges. So there's increase in caseloads, as we all know, raising incidents in cancer, aging population, treatment complexity, 
um, tasks and administration is constantly going up. We have quality assurance programs in Canada. Every case needs to be reviewed. And so that's, again, additional tasks that is not really even quoted as a work. So we just have to do it. But, you know, is that work? No, it's not. Is that paid? No. So we also get exposed to death and suffering and uh, particularly for adults. I mean, there's a highly toxic therapy that's for brachytherapy as well, right? With neurotherapeutic indices sometimes that really affects us. And then the medical knowledge is really expanding more rapidly than in any other, any other segment of medicine. So I'll show you some graphs. It's quite staggering to see that. There's expectations and requirements for research, engagement in clinical teaching and medical schools and whatnot. So look at the look at the actually cancer related entries in the PubMed. So this is this is cancer and this is everything else. So if you think like you have difficulties keeping up with your literature, so this will explain to you why. I mean, this field is absolutely like exploding. And so why uh, the authors suspect that cancer incidence is increasing and therefore research is also increasing. There's more funding available for cancer research. But also there's a speculation that the scientific advances may have greater impact in cancer patients than in other diseases. So therefore all of this above has increased uh, the publication in, in cancer medicine significantly. All right, so the job, we kind of touched up on all of this and I would just say the lack of staff support is significant. At least uh, we feel that here in our institution leadership and it's a huge problem, compensation, complexity, constant change. This is what we are grappling about. There's a constant change. You're never kind of good at what you do. There's always something next, something else that kind of comes up. And the typical workday has become a puzzle box to find and allocate additional time in physicians' busy schedule to actually meet the clinical care expectations. So that becomes, oh, I have to see the patients now. Oh my God, I'm so busy. So this is a key slide for you to understand what is the difference between stress and burnout. Stress, we all get stressed. Stress is actually quite good for us if managed properly. Stress really kind of keeps you on your toes and keeps you engaged and, and keeps your brain working. Stress is actually really healthy for us. So there is a tank here and tank is full of physical, emotional, and spiritual kind of energy. And then when that fuel goes down and then we recover, that's just the stress and that's completely normal. So you go off and you have a lovely weekend, you come back and you're all energized. The problem is when you cannot actually recover. And so energy is really in this downward spiral. It's almost like energy is leaking. You go on vacation, you barely recover, you come back and you're back to where you were before. You just cannot cope anymore. So that's the burnout. That's the huge difference. And so what has contributed to that? Well, I would say, for, first of all, our medical education and our conditioning that we go through during our medical education, we really are taught how to be workaholics. Um, the only solution ever is just work harder. We are stuck with doing everything ourselves. We are rarely actually thought to ask for help. We should not have any emotions about our patients or ourselves. We're guilty and inadequate basically. And you know we should not be showing any of the feelings that we do have as human as a human beings and we should also be the superheroes and perfectionists and so we should um, uh, save everybody right so everybody should get their cancers cured nobody's allowed to fail so if they do it's all of a sudden like our personal failure and we really agonize over irrelevant details sometimes and so all of that kind of tends to bring us down and we learned that in the medical school and so here is the prevalence of depression, depressive symptoms and suicidal ideation among the medical students. And this is meta-analysis of all the medical schools around the globe. And so they look at uh, you know, over 130,000 medical students in 47 countries, 195 studies. And what they found that the incidence of depression with medical students is 27%, ranges from nine to 55%. And suicidal ideation is 11%, ranges 7 to 24%. Like, this is absolutely horrendous. This is absolutely horrendous. And it's not just happening in the US or Canada, it's actually happening everywhere. This is the part of our profession. And we really need to own this. So, what we basically get trained to do, we are conditioned um, for overgiving and overcommitment. 
and we really lack personal boundaries. We lack personal boundaries. And so the patient always comes first. And so all of these professions who have the highest burnout rates are the ones uh, with this same mantra, customer comes first. These are hospitality people, healthcare workers, military and police. And we should never really show the weakness and we never ask for help and we do not recognize that we actually need help ourselves. So this is important to kind of just uh, soak in a little bit. So uh, we just overgive, we are always overcommitted and we lack our boundaries around uh, our personal time and energy and what we can do. And we can't even recognize it. There was a wonderful New York Times article uh, the business of uh, health care depends on exploiting doctors and nurses. <laughs> and so what they say is medical systems are counting on nurses and doctors to suck it up because you know that they want to walk away from their patients. It's not just bad strategy, it's a bad medicine. And that's very true. This is how we are. I see it as a result of administrative creep. One additional task after another is piled onto the clini clinical staff members who can't and won't say no. So this is our problem. We just do not ever say no. We always say, oh yeah, we'll do it. We'll do it, right? And this is just for you to show where, where the problem is. From 1975 to 2010, the number of healthcare administrators has increased 3,200%. And now there is roughly, and this is data from the United States, there are roughly about 10 administrators for every doctor. So that's why you have to work so hard because you have to now actually make money for these 10 administrators that are above your neck. And you tell me if that's not correct. I think it is. And so to show you how correct this is, this is a source bureau and labor statistics from your own country. And here is the website and the, and the link to this. And you see the uh, administration growth. And here's the doctor's growth from 1975 to 2010. That is absolutely amazing. Okay. And so at the end of the day, the trouble with a rat race is that even then, if you win your race, you will still be a rat. <laughs> I think this is a sobering little cartoon. So I would say if you, re you can recognize it, you can actually change it and the relationship with your career can recover and be, and the best use of this burnout is really to return to your practice with a purpose and become a little bit more conscientious and conscious. And I had changed my practice for sure. And I also engage in burnout education now and that gives me a great pleasure and joy to see people kind of just waking up. And so what can you do for yourself? And um, I would say with great power comes great responsibility but also with great responsibility comes the great power. And this is a very important slide. So just understand that you can't really solve that problem of the burnout. There's no solution to this, but you have to really kind of think about this. And it's really, as Dr. Seuss would say, it's a balancing act. So you have to have a strategy and you have to be aware of the time and energy that you actually do have and really have strict boundaries about this. And then find three things to start building your balance. And so here's something that I find this slide really actually key and just kind of try to soak as much in as you can. And first is really to recognize our medical culture and, and recognize that we are workaholics and we tend to be this lone ranger and we have no emotions and we're superheroes. And this mantra, patient comes first, you drop everything always. Like you can't do that always, right? Even at eight o'clock at night, always, no. And never show any weakness you have to recognize this is the culture that we have. And then there's some strategy to actually really get you home on time. This is where I started. I was kind of hanging in my office until 7, 7, 30 and doing all the contouring and everything. It's like, and then I think like, why am I doing this? Why am I here at seven o'clock and why am I here? So this was my first um, act of balancing to actually leave the office. And my goal was to leave the office at five. So even though that ha didn't happen, because it was my goal, it started to happen more often. And now it's more like a, um, a daily occurrence almost, not that I leave every day at five, but this is something that I'm really striving to and very cognizant of what time it is right now. So you have to really get uh, good at these um, electronic medical records. There's always a, a, a wizard in your department who kind of figure it all out. So go to the wizard and see what they're doing and you can always learn something. 
because we're really never actually given the time to learn how to effectively use the, the electronic records. And so have a lot of handouts for the patients about the side effects, about whatever. And so you just give them that and you don't have to kind of, you know, cover everything for every single patient. They will still get the information. And do batch processing. Please do not multitask. <laughs> we all kind of pride ourselves how good we are at multitasking. Multitasking really kind of damages your brain. And you never really multitask. You're just able to kind of switch from one task to another and then you kind of try to switch back and forth you know multiple times and that is exhausting so i would say don't try to multitask just focus on one task answer your emails twice a day don't always look at them and so try to just be cognizant of really being focused when you're doing something also think about what's on your bucket list and bucket list for the, the day, bucket list for the week, bucket list for the month and your what regrets you may have if you don't do it. And plan your week and really add some meaningful activities, something that you actually are going to look forward to. I think this is so important. So I always have something, oh, I'm really looking forward to whatever. This is so incredibly important. That kind of keeps you going. Have the family calendar, particularly if you have little kids at home, you know, so everybody can share a calendar, you know, create some tasks for everybody. Um, and you must actually complete these tasks that you put into your calendar. This is going to be as important as your next board meeting in your hospital. So this is very important to actually add something into a calendar that is for you and really, really stick to it. So there is no canceling that. This is, this is your um, showing how important you are to yourself and your family as well. And how to change if you want to actually change your practice and your life, new awareness. And this is what we're doing today. It's not going to be you know, enough. It's going to be mandatory, but really not sufficient. And the key is really to take an action. You have to take an action. First, you have to start with your visions, like what do you want to accomplish? How is that going to look like? And then really take the small questions, ask the small questions, do the small, you know, saying start somewhere very, very small and then just slowly build on it. Because once you see that something is working, you will be encouraging yourself to actually do a little bit more here, a little bit more there. And then one day you realize like, actually my life is better. And so for different results, you must take different actions. Otherwise, you're going to end up like Robert before and after, who in only two weeks lost his glasses. So Robert didn't do anything else. He just lost his glasses. Okay. And so, as I said, implement only one thing at a time and change, really do small changes because you cannot change the whole thing right away unless you go through a crisis. And every crisis was, we, is going to prompt you to change a lot. And that's always extremely stressful and never really pleasant. So small changes. If you think about when they fly the plane from, let's say, um, LA to, to Hawaii, they're never on the course. They're always off the course. And so what they're doing is they're constantly correcting that plane and constantly navigating back to Hawaii, right? So um, you're never going to be 100%. But if you constantly kind of course correct, you will actually end up being where you want to be. So it's not important to balance every day, even every week. But if you're cognizant of all of this, you at the end of the, end of the week or month, you will be able to end up with a balanced and satisfying life. The really most important thing is to recognize the boundaries around yourself personally and your time and energy and reclaim your blood flow because your boundaries will kind of bring you back your blood flow. And also we are kind of perfectionist and, you know, we're all type A personalities. We fear the failure and uh, we really overextend yourselves. And I would say yeah, professional failures are not pleasant for sure. But I think failures always should be regarded as, uh, you know, learning experiences. There's always something to learn. They also redirect us into a completely different, you know, um, uh, you know, path. So they're actually extremely valuable and they perhaps set us from something new. And I would say my personal failure and, you know, and, and my personal burnout has completely redirect, you know, what I do now and what I'm interested in and, and how I view my life and my career. And then also resilience is certainly something that we need to um, deal with and, and how to see, deal with setbacks and arrows. But I'll show you data to suggest that we are probably the most resilient segment of society. Because I know when they tell me in my organization, oh, we got to do more yoga and become more resilient. And I would always say, well, you must be joking. If I'm not resilient, I really don't know who it is, really, and, and just a medical profession in general. 
All right, so I'm just going to stop here and maybe ask Brian to kind of reflect on his story and tell us what he's gone through before I talk to you a little bit about medical culture and organization as well. Well, Mira, that was, that was spectacular. Uh, that's me. Everything you, I mean, that's the path I've been down. And I never knew I was headed that way. And it, you don't know. And it hit me. And I literally experienced everything you just showed us. Um, and I, I'm not ashamed to say it. it, it happened. And I didn't know how it happened. And I just all of a sudden, it was, I, I was in a very bad, I, I had, from all the surgery I've done over the years, I developed a bad radiculopathy in my neck and I went through a major uh, anterior fusion at four levels on my neck. And that knocked me down quite a bit. Uh, but shortly, three weeks after that, I was in the car and I was almost killed by a semi truck. And so I think those two episodes made me realize that I couldn't just keep fooling myself and going at the pace I was going because I was going. And I, I'm 60 for those of you that don't know me. Um, but I was pushing hard every day, you know, no problem. I can do it. I'm invincible. And it just, it was an eye opening experience. And I just, I said, something's wrong. Something's very wrong. And the first thing I did is, you know, if I were to give advice on that, I would say, obviously go to your family and say, you know what, I'm hurting. I don't know what it is. Um, go to your colleagues, go to your staff, tell them, you know, and I was, uh, a couple of my staff members are listening right now. And I would just go to them, I'd look them right in the eye and say, I'm really, I'm not the Superman that everybody thinks I am, I'm broken. And accepting it was probably the best thing was is the most important thing is just accepting the fact that you have that you're not the Superman. And I was the Superman up until 59 years old, whatever, until it all happened. Um, but, you know, being honest with yourself and saying enough's enough. I, I want to be there for my patients. I want to be there for my family, but I'm only capable of so much. And you mentioned boundaries. And so what I did, Mary, after seeing your talk in, in Big Sky, you know, I spoke to you privately and uh, I set boundaries and I set them hard. And I no longer was I, you know, pulling the big hours, you know, and trying to be somebody that I no longer had this, the energy or the physical ability to do. And I've accepted it. It's been a very hard transitional year in that sense. And then on top of it, we've had a lot of, you know, my practice has just turned upside down and I lost the majority of my team. I mean, we were like a formula one race team up until a year or two ago. And it's no, but it's, it's, it's that aspect of administrators and where the money's made. And I was never focused on money. I was focused on service and we were, we were the best. And um, now instead of having guys change my tires and fill my car with fuel, I'm getting out of the car and putting the tire on and doing all the things a pit crew does. And it's, yeah, it's a different world. So it's, a, how do I say this? It's evolving with the changing environment. And I think mm -hmm. you touched on that. It's an environment that it's like a river. It's changing for all of us. And we have to be accepting of it, but also draw the line, you know, because we are, we're all givers. You know, we, we will please, we're pleasers, we're givers. And I would never turn my back on a patient, but these administrators can be ruthless. And when it comes to the dollar with private equity, you better be look out. So I'll be quiet for now. Okay, thank you, Brian. Thank you so much. So we'll talk a little bit about Myra, uh, medical. Myra, hello, Myra, this is Gregory Merrick. Can I make a comment? Yeah, please, Gregory, please. Good to hear from you, man. Uh, well, well, Myra, that's an unbelievable talk and you reinforced so much of what we've tried to do in our group. And I think that we've done a pretty good job of, uh, of controlling burnout. But one of the questions that I often ask new staff is why do you come to work? And very often they say, I come to take care of patients. And that answer is wrong. You come to take care of yourself. And the first thing that we try to emphasize, you have to be selfish because you're of no good to me the patients or anyone else, if you're not taking care of yourself first, you have to be healthy. And one of the things that we've tried to emphasize to our staff, and I think it's helped a lot, 
is that it's almost a we versus them from that administrative standpoint, uh, that they're part of something bigger than they could be themselves. They have a purpose. They uh, have autonomy, which I think is extremely important in limiting burnout when people think that their voice and their, their energy and their job mean something. Try to get people to stay in the present not thinking too far ahead. And you pointed out this fear of failure. And I think we see this more in young physicians because younger generations, and I think in part because of social media, have a greater fear of failure than than ever. And as you pointed out, failure is not bad. Failure is a good thing. Failure is necessary on the road to success. It, It doesn't define who we are, but it's something that we should learn from. Uh, And that is kind of been our focus and everything that you said fed into that. I thought your presentation was remarkable. Thank you. I I cannot agree with you more. It's always difficult to kind of pick and choose what to put together so people have a good sense of what is going on. But let me tell you, like the medical culture, right? So here we go. Oh, God, he's dead, right? So this is who we are, right? We are the canaries. And so once we start falling dead, like that doesn't work for anybody, right? Does it? So look at this. I mean, this is a very new data from just July 2020 because we are told like, oh, you should be more resilient. Like, well, okay, come on. Come on, guys. Like, look at it. So this is a study that look at over 5,000 um, U.S. physicians and 5,000 other workers in the United States who have like com- compatible, like um, high level corporate jobs, right? So each one point increase in resilience and resilience scale is very simple and it goes from zero to eight is associated with 36% decrease in the odds of a burnout. So more resilient you are, less likely to be burned out you are. And physicians actually have the highest personal resilience than any other workers in the US, okay? Which is like, okay, duh. Like we all gone through this medical training and we know what, you know, we know that we are resilient. But even 29% of physicians with the highest possible resilience score of eight were actually burnt out. So you can be resilient until the cows come home, but this is now the environment that is actually causing it. And you're quite right, uh, Greg, to point out that organization has a lot to do with this and actually the really the culture in the organization. So what is the culture? The culture is really, um, you know, stable, deep and broad organizational kind of approach. And uh, this is how organizations actually survived having particular culture. And it does provide a meaning and predictability and security. And the culture is really a source of strength. I mean, if you look at our Western culture, it is a st- source of our strength, but also it has challenges, right? And the things that you need to change are only part of that culture. We don't need to change entire culture. Um, and the rest of the culture will help us actually make the changes. So we have to kind of work with this and we have to work with these administrators, right? We cannot just say, well, the hell with you now, we're gonna run the show. No, we actually need each other, right? But this is where the problem is. We say something and we have this kind of a hidden culture and a hidden curriculum, if, if you wish, in the medical schools. And we say that physicians are professionals, we trust them, right? But our behavior on the part of administrators is that you need this pre-authorization and you need excessive documentations because we actually don't trust you, right? And then we say that physicians are most important resource, but then we kind of load you with this clerical burden and ineffectively use your time. So really we behave differently from what we say that we value. Self-care is important. We kind of trumpet around that, but then we kind of, you know, uh, work always come first. There's excessive work hours. So really self-care is actually not important. This is our behavior that uh, kind of shows that. High quality of care uh, is our top priority. Well, not really. The system drivers of fatigue and burnout erode quality of that care. So focus is really on the finances and volume, not really on the on the patient or the quality of care. It's actually the volume and the finances. This is as our behavior shows. And prevention is better than treatment. Well, not really, because we don't attend to our own healthcare needs. So there is this hidden kind of values in the culture that are non spoken, not really spoken. They're not out on the open, but if you ask anybody, they will tell you what they are because they know and they feel it every day. 
so this is again in my next read in um, Medscape Ecology, November 24. I thought it was fabulous because she talks about, uh, she's a family, uh, sorry, emergency doctor. And she talks about how our culture is our own and we actually need to own it. And so um, I'm keenly aware that our sense of professionalism, duty and identity contribute to our, oral, our own moral distress. We really need to own that. And so she talks about herself being a medical student and sitting there for six hours in the operating room and kind of, you know, doing the retracting the tissues. And then she got tired and she got sick and kind of they looked down upon her and whatnot. And then the surgeon proceeded to talk about the story of Prometheus. And then uh, he talked about uh, how, just like Prometheus, we should be actually resilient even when we are in the agony. And then he just adds in the end of the story, because this is who we are. So this is this hidden medical school curriculum, right? This is what you're taught. You just have to be there. You just have to be as resilient, even though you may be in agony, you, even though you may have to go to the bathroom, even though you're six hours standing up, you know, and it's surgery and it's midnight and you're tired. No, you have to be resilient. You have to be there. You always have to be there, right? And so we set up these impossible standards for ourselves. And we also like the failure and, and, and need for this external validation is something that is really, I think, detrimental for us. We need to have this sense of internal validation, not always external validation. And uh, so this external validation that we seek really um, um, it affirms that we, we belong to that culture and builds up that self image that at the end of the day really becomes detrimental for all of us. We we'll learn that. So where is the where should be the focus? Well, um, this is a Mayo Clinic model. Mayo Clinic actually has the lowest attrition of all the physicians in the country. And they, they have been working on the quality or care organization and, and preventing the burnout and, and well being of the organizations and physicians for many years. And I think they're probably the leaders in the industry. And uh, Tate Shanafeld actually had a presentation in Vancouver a couple of weeks ago, and this is from his presentation and from his work. He thinks that really this is where the focus should be because 20% of all of this burnout issue is you, me, and all of us, and really 80% is organization. And so we need to look at the community of our departments as well as our hospitals. And this is really what uh, contributes to healthy work um, and life balance and, and community and meaning in work, control and flexibility. This is what we actually need to be happy. We don't necessarily need more money. We are really having a different uh, reason why we go to work every day. We really want to contribute, but we do need respect and flexibility. And we, we need to um, you know, have this meaning at work because this is not a job. This is calling for most of us. This is not a job what we do. This is calling. And so goals don't determine success, system determines the success. I think this is probably really, sorry, somebody's just calling me. This is probably the most important uh, point of this slide. The systems determine success. If you don't rise to the level of your goals, you fail to the level of your systems. And I think our systems are beginning to actually fail us. They're not getting that I'm not available. Okay, so organization needs to provide really, um, um, workload that is manageable. We have to have some control over that workload and over how we do our jobs. There has to be a reward. There has to be community and social support and networks of colleagues, right? Fairness. And we have to align with the values of organizational cultures. And so organizations are now moving from this triple aim, which used to kind of contain enhancing patient experience, improving population health and reducing costs now to quadruple aim organizations would also actually include high quality patient care that is actually rooted in the health and well-being of, again, providers. Okay, so that includes all of us, really nurses and all of the staff that actually works in the hospital. And so this is where the whole industry is moving and I hope to see more of that. And, and the purpose of this talk is so you guys get engaged into your own institutions and actually become advocates for yourself and for your colleagues. And this is the healthy organization. So I'm again, happy to share the slides, but they, these are the kind of a key components of healthy organizations. And then at the end of the day, so there's some resources here. I found a lot of excellent personal resources in this um, 
uh, Dyke Drummond, who um, has the website and the courses in Seattle, which I attended, and a lot of personal tips, and so a lot of the content is actually from, from his courses. And then again, uh, Tate Shanafeld and Mayo Clinic is really fantastic to kind of just give you an idea how to approach organizations and what actually needs to be present there for things to work for, for both parties. And at the end of the day, I would say we should care about ourselves, not because we care for other people, but because we matter. So I think that's the end of my presentation, so. Wonderful. Yeah, that's really great, Mira. And it that's kind of in the same sentiment uh, as Dr. Merrick as a clinical leader, Dr. Moran as a clinical leader. They're bringing to their own organization, to their own environment to, to stress that. It's because we do matter. You know, I, I go back about five years and ago, and I was listening to this podcast. And on the podcast, it was of super successful people. And the idea of... Uh, life work um, balance came up and and they all agreed if you're mentioning life work balance then you already have a problem and you know I looked around and everybody talked about that and so I started asking all my colleagues you know do you think about this and everybody did and so I had a meeting with the dean coming up and I asked my dean like what is our thoughts on this and I had I had linked it to physician burnout at that time and you know there was just no formal programming and luckily and you brought us kind of circle where the thoughts are coming on this and how we do matter and we do need to address that. And there are ways, you know, whether you're a small organization or a big organization that you can approach this. But I also, I, in a follow-up question to my friends that were talking about, because they're all physicians and we all, we all have all these stressors about their life work balance. I ask, I ask people, you know, have you ever contemplated um, counseling? And Catherine, you know, it's, the, it's amazing. The webinar. It's, can it's, I? It's, being 100% with the prevalence being 50% of physician burnout, how, how little physicians consider themselves for counseling. And it turns out only my psychiatrist friends get counseling. Every, all of us, the rest of us, you know, decline it, ignore it. We never bring up these issues with our own physicians. You've touched on a lot of these issues, but it seems like, you know, we as leaders and as, as colleagues, we, we have a role within our institution, but we also have a a role in our personal relationships, identifying this in other people and helping people go about this too. I mean, where does counseling fit in? You know, what is advocacy along these lines? Um, what, what do you think, Mira, Brian, Dr. Merrick, others on the phone? Go ahead, Greggy. Uh, I think the thing when we look at our, our staffs that, you know, there's an old saying that no one cares how much you know till they know how much you care. And, and that's the first thing that I think that we have to instill uh, within our departments. And then I think it's extremely important. There's good research that has demonstrated that daily exercise, adequate sleep, good nutrition, all substantially reduces stress and reduces the incidence of burnout. I think one of the things that physicians make a problem at is that there's, they spend too much time with physicians. You know, you put 10 physicians in a room and unfortunately, you come out and one plus one equals 10 because the problem has been amplified. It's, you know, who can who, who's had a harder time than others. So I think that, that there's times we need to see a different backdrop. Uh, I think we need to see different aspects of life. And that's something that needs to be um, uh, communicated to the staff that, you know, look, we're going to stay in the present. We're going to do the best we can do. We're going to fail. Everybody fails, uh, but we're going to do it as a team and we're going to do it together. We're in this as one. Um, and th that's, I think, a lot of what is missing within individual departments in all phases of medicine. Yeah. I also would say, you know, there is a very interesting uh, randomized controlled trial for that matter from Mayo Clinic as well. And it's about like, how can physicians support each other, right? And so they, they took a group of um, physicians and who just kind of continued their own um, 
uh, uh, work and they give them an hour every two weeks to do whatever they want to do with that hour. And there's a second group of physicians who actually had a meeting and there were like a groups of like six to seven physicians and they would meet and then they would have a, like a dinner together or cater lunch or whatever. And they had uh, some specific questions to discuss. So it's not about you go to these meetings and you rant about how your day was difficult and how difficult patients were or whatever. You actually have a question and then everybody shares in their views on the question. And the questions would be about meaning in medicine, about communications with the patients about how they handle the grief, you know, with, uh, with patient encounters, how they balance personal life and, you know, uh, professional life. So, and then they would discuss these topics. And the physicians who participated in these groups have far less burnout than those who don't. And I think, you know, I don't know if in your hospitals is the case in our hospitals, there's no more doctor's lounge. We have no time to get together. We have no time to interact with each other. That's been kind of taken away from us. And I think this is really detrimental to our profession. So that's just one little segment of like, we are actually not supporting each other anymore. We're kind of a, even more alone. We're not gathering together. We, we are not mentoring each other. And that's missing. That's hugely missing. Mira, I want to expound on that. Um, I was fortunate enough to grow up in the U.S. in, in training when you would literally, you know, we'd all eat lunch together, regardless of who, you know, competitors or whatever. And then all of a sudden, I think the year would have been, you know, early nineties when all in, in the U S at least all these hospital systems. It's like, Hey, Moran, you play for the other team. You're, you're not welcome to talk to our surgeons or you're not. And overnight, you know, when I came out of training, I'd be reading the journals, going to these colleagues that were competitors of our group. And, and educating them and, and, and we would have difficult cases and we'd reach out not to our partners, but to our competitors and say, hey, have you ever seen this? And there was such an immense collegiality. It was so rewarding and, and it disappeared with the billboards and with all this competitive marketing in this country, at least in the US. And it's been very destructive and that's what's missing. You hit the nail on the head. There's no more sitting in the lounge between cases and talking to your colleagues, whether it's about family, whether it's about patients, but it was very powerful. It's gone. It it's is gone. no yep. longer existent. Yeah, we don't have a doctor's lounge here. We are really fighting badly. And in the neighboring hospital, in Cover General Hospital, they finally open up a doctor's lounge and they're not allowed to call it doctor's lounge. Can you imagine that? I used to it's get only open to doctors, but they're not allowed to call it doctor's lounge. I don't even know what it's called. I do it's just ridiculous. Colleagues. Every day we would meet and now I have to wait for an ABS meeting to you exactly. know, enjoy <laughs> that with other colleagues. You know, it's, it's horrible. Exactly. Exactly. You know, so yeah, th there is a lot of really ounces to, to these issues, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, I always like to talk to my residents and say that the real issue is how do you relate to yourself? And so, um, and why do you do this work and what does it actually mean to you? And, um, and you have to have personal boundaries around your work and personal boundaries around other people. And as, as Greg said, you have to actually be selfish at the end of the day. And if you don't have enough for yourself, whatever that is, you cannot give to others. So you have to fill in your cup full first in order to to have the cup that is overflowing so to be able to give to others. Otherwise you can't. Otherwise that's how you deplete yourself and you deplete yourself very fast. And, and particularly with this uh, whole millennial issues or Z generation issues that they're so averse to failure, the old perfectionism, you know, the, the, the foster perfectionism, looking, looking at Facebook and everybody's best pictures, right? And how everybody's having a great life. So uh, it's, it's actually detrimental. It's probably going to be detrimental for the entire society because if we ever want to learn something, we have to learn how to fail and fail on a grand level and learn from it. And that's what life is all about. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah, that's really brilliant, uh, Mira. I think that question you asked your residents goes right to the heart. And if I could capture that last two minutes that you shared with us, I think that's 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 what we share. I, I think that's just so profound and and um, so thoughtful. And and thank you. That's the very question that needs to be asked um, of our systems, of ourselves, and of our of the people around us that we're trying to influence. That's really strong. 
I think we're at our end. And um, I wanna thank Dr. Moran, Dr. Keyes, Dr. Merrick for participating just for the unbelievable sharing that, that happened this last hour. Um, thank you ABS for the sponsorship of this and, and the participators for their volunteering their time to share with us. And um, any, any final comments from um, Dr. Moran, Dr. Keyes, Dr. Merrick? I'd like to thank personally Mira for her, number one, her knowledge and her ability to present a very complex issue that I was a victim of and I was lost. And by God only knows what, you know, Big Sky Montana, Mira, I'll never forget it. Just the advice you gave me. I said, what do I do? She goes, you've got to re-engage. And I mean, I'm, I said, I'm going fishing, I'm done. And she says, no, Brian, you need to find your purpose find your balance. And I did. And I cannot wait to see you and give you a big hug because I'm so grateful to you. I'm not there yet. It, it is a process. It takes it's a process. Yeah. It's this a is, process. This is a process. And I'm probably into this now uh, a good year, if not a little more. And I think to all of my colleagues listening to this, it's just, if anybody thought they were Superman, it was me. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I'm not a braggart or anything, but I thought mm -hmm. I could take mm -hmm. on the world mm -hmm. and nobody's immune to this. Mm -hmm. Be on guard and yeah. recognize the symptoms and study mirrors lecture and pay attention because it's very real. Yeah. And I will just finish, like you mentioned the purpose. So, so what is the purpose? People sometimes go around and kind of bang their heads like, okay, what's my purpose? What's my purpose? Well, purpose in life is anything like what's the purpose for the bees it's just to make honey right that's their purpose and for us we have a passionate interest in something which is medicine or now well-being of other physicians so that's the interest and then if i expand my interest and i learn and i personally grow from knowing more about what is interesting for me anyway and then i contribute to others this is my purpose this is my honey this is, I'm a bee, I make honey, and so I'm sharing my honey. So this is now what is interesting for me, apart from brachytherapy, which is still very interesting for me. But, you know, I, I now expand what I know, and then I want to share that with you guys, and hopefully somebody will have something that will click in their mind and, and think a little bit differently tomorrow. And it, it's all wonderful. That's my purpose right now. Myra, purpose I just is wanted... very simple. I just want to thank you as well. You, I heard your talk the first time at Big Sky almost a year ago, and um, it's. I think from just reading the comments, and you know, regardless of where you're at in your career, and, and especially for the the younger generation and the physicists, I mean, we're we're all struggling with this issue, and I'm just really so pleased that ABS would highlight such a critical issue because we need to take care of ourselves. I mean, yeah. I mean, I I have that Superman problem as well too, and uh, it just I think what I like to do, and, and it's, we. And, and I was glad that all this is available on YouTube. I really want to share this with all my own administrators, Cancer Center. It's just a lot for us to reflect on. And, and thank you so much. It's wonderful. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for organizing all of this. And it's really generous from ABS to, to give us an opportunity to discuss that um, uh, in, in this venue. Thank you. Any other comments? All I remember last year is Myra, her, her parting comment was, I shut the door at five. So I know you're still working on that. Yeah. <laughs> I still do that yeah. with the yes. bang, with a bang at five o'clock. So everybody knows I'm going home. Yes. Leave Myra yes. alone. But thank you. Yes. Leave me alone at five. <laughs> yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Good evening. And thank you, Brian, for you know your honesty and your sharing. I think it's very important for people to to and, hear and, these stories because we all go through the same thing. And, and I will I will offer this to anybody listening. If anybody wants to reach out to me personally and privately, I am more than willing to talk to them because that's how much I care about this. And I'll tell you something funny. One of my purposes I've taken on unusual purposes. One's taking garbage out, whether I'm at my house or my friend's house. I'm like the water boy. I'm into garbage. I take garbage out. I love a clean garbage can. So maybe I, gotta, I don't know. But little things like that and trimming my neighbor's bushes with my hedge clippers. So I found Fun. the Come you know, to Vancouver. We have lots of garbage and we need a lot of trimmings and we'll have a good good time together. It's just you take that stress and you be silly. Yeah. You know, be silly. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.
Thank you, Bynum.